today I got an invitation to you. No self-condemnation. No condemnation at all. I know, I know, I know. I'm supposed to be off. I thought I was all done yesterday. But I was up the other night listening to a talk by Dallas Willard. And there was an observation in it that was so profound and so helpful to me that I couldn't not pass it on to you. So that's what I'm doing. Again, I'm going to be taking a break. I'm actually, my wife and I and one of our kids are going over to Switzerland. Uh, we have friends that has a house there and they're letting us stay in it. And while I'm over there, one of the people I'm going to be reading is Paul Turnier, who was a Swiss physician, Christian author. And so I'm going to share some of that stuff with you when I get back. The team with Become New is going to be sharing some best of stuff and why they like it, how they are growing, how they're changing. So you have that to look forward to. But here's what I wanted to say today. Uh, it, you may know, if you're a Bible person, in Romans, the eighth chapter, there's a fabulous statement. Paul had been talking in Romans chapter seven about why do I do what I don't want to do? Why do I not do the things that I want to do? I, I know the things that I value, and yet I can't seem to live up to them. And it's kind of a wretched way to live. And then he says in Romans chapter eight, there is now therefore no more condemnation for those who who are in Christ Jesus, who belong to Jesus, who identify with Jesus, who trust Jesus, who, like those of us who are in the fellowship of the withered hand, say, I can't do it. I can't be that person, but God, you can help me, and I think I'll surrender. I'll, I'll try to let you. Now, that's quite a famous verse in the Bible, and I had always thought that basically what it means is after you die, as long as you believe the right things about Jesus and his death on the cross, then you will not be condemned to hell, but you'll be able to live forever in heaven. And of course, Dallas would say, uh, part of the good news of that verse is that if you trust Jesus with your life, then for sure death itself does not need the whole terror for you and cannot be an obstacle to who you become or your eternal destiny with him forever beyond death. But there is now therefore no condemnation is actually much larger than what God will say in that day. And it has to do with what I will say and what you will say in this day and the world in which we love. It's actually freedom from a way of life, a system in which we live, because we live in a culture that runs on condemnation. Now, this has actually been true since the beginning of the fall with Adam and Eve when they each sought to blame or condemn one another for what they had done, and that's been happening ever since. We feel it in very strong ways in our day. We live in a culture of condemnation. We try to... Um, navigate our way through life by apportioning blame, moral badness to other people. It's navigation by condemnation. If you look at cable news, uh, our political world runs that way. So that this is not just about discernment of what is good or what is bad. It's not just, I believe that this policy or these practices will help us most. It's us versus them and they are bad people. Moral discernment, judgment in that sense is a real good thing. I go to my dermatologist and I expect my dermatologist to point out flaws and blemishes in my skin. I don't receive that as condemnation. That's actually what he's supposed to do. If he said, your skin's great, you got no problems, I would die. What I don't expect from him is for him to say, what kind of a miserable human being are you? How much time did you spend in the sun? What's the uh, to condemn someone is not simply to be aware of important moral distinctions, but to suggest that that person is bad, possibly irredeemable, possibly worthless, and I want to have nothing to do with them. I distance myself from them. I recognize no commonality between me and them, no obligation for me to love. I am not for them. To condemn is to exclude, to withdraw and attack, Dallas writes in one of his book about an old expression we have for people that we condemn. We say that what they have done, who they are, is beyond the pale. In the ancient world, the tribal community would gather together uh, with firelight. That was part of a way that people had a sense of belonging and protection. And so when someone was excluded, they were uh, thrust outside the community beyond where even the dim light of the fire 
might illumine them. In other words, beyond the pale. It's interesting. We create technology and then we use it to exclude other people. So in our day, rather than beyond the pale, we might talk about canceling somebody. It would be better if their show just was not aired anymore. Or um, uh, we'll talk in our day about virtue signaling. I will make these decisions. I will talk about other people in a negative way to show what a good person I am. This is very interesting. Dallas points out, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 8. You can look this up. Paul talks about uh, the old ministry, the coming of the law, as the ministry of condemnation. And he says there is a certain glory in it. And there is. When I become aware of the difference between right and wrong, and I can point that out, um, it's a glorious thing. It makes me feel really good. And often condemning other people to say they, that group, people of that ideology, people with that practice, they are wrong. There's a certain kind of glory in that, but it leads to death. And that's why Paul goes on to say how much greater glory the ministry of the Spirit, the Spirit who brings love and brings joy and brings peace. So when Paul says there is now therefore no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, he's not just talking about what God is going to say someday after you die. He's talking about right here and right now we can be deliver delivered from the system of condemnation and live without fearing God's condemning us, without condemning other people, or without condemning ourselves. Because of who God is. It says in the third chapter of John, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Jesus was constantly associating with people that the society around him condemned, lepers, tax collectors, Samaritans, in order to communicate God's acceptance and love and desire for inclusion. In John the eighth chapter, there's a woman who was caught in adultery and the religious leaders wanted to stone her. You remember that? And Jesus said, let the one who is without sin cast the first stone and none of them do. And what he says to the woman is, do they not condemn you? Neither do I. I have not come here to condemn you. And that doesn't mean there are no moral judgments. What he says next is go and sin no more. But now being accepted and loved, she has the power to do what he asks. So today, no condemning even of yourself. One of the things that I struggle with is I will compare myself to other people and there can be this vague sense of condemnation, self-condemnation. I'm not talking about challenging myself with high moral standards or being convicted appropriately by God. That will bring a sense of energy and uh, desire to pursue what is redemption, to do what is right, to make amends. I'm talking about chronic, low-level sense of inadequacy that breeds despair and tends to paralyze. And I'll compare myself to, this person has developed their ability to play the piano or uh, is a really, really good athlete or looks really good or manages their money better or is better with their friends or is better as a parent. And I can just get sucked into this morass of not enough, not enough, not enough, not enough. There is no condemnation now for those who are in Christ Jesus. So I can ask the Spirit of God, would you show me? Where do you want me to grow? How do you want me to change? What needs to be set right in me? But I don't live in the morass of despair. And then when others challenge me, I don't have to receive it as condemnation. Nancy and I had both been traveling. I was the last one home. When she returned home, she sent a picture of an empty peanut butter jar with a sad, frowning face. We both eat peanut butter in the morning. I'd been the last one home. Peanut butter was gone. I hadn't replaced it. And I sent back this email. Well, yes, I was the last one there. But on that Sunday, I went to the pharmacy. I was trying to refill a prescription and I was going to buy peanut butter there. I didn't have my wallet with me. They didn't have the prescription. There was a problem with the doctor's office. They wouldn't let me charge the peanut butter to the car that's on file if I wasn't getting a prescription renewed. And all of this is like justifying why I should not be blamed, why I should not be condemned for not having had replaced the peanut butter. Why couldn't I just say, I'm sorry? 
I want you to have peanut butter. I want to be the kind of person who cares about those around them and would want them to have good things. And I could have, should have taken care. Well, why couldn't I just? Because there is something inside me that fears being condemned, placed beyond the pale, canceled. And I know the pain of those fears and those feelings. And in some ways, I suppose these last couple of years have brought them more and more to the surface. And the answer to all of that is not to justify myself in the eyes of anybody, although I'm tempted to try. And it's not to work harder to condemn myself for ways that I don't live up in which there is no power and no goodness. Dallas says the hardest thing for people to understand about God is his non-condemning nature. The hardest thing for people to understand about God is his non-condemning nature. He didn't send his son into this world to condemn it. Therefore, uh, in Christ Jesus, there is no more condemnation. If God is for us, who shall be against us? Who shall condemn? What do we do instead? Instead of condemning yourself, Dallas says, bless yourself. God bless my mind, bless my soul, bless my heart. Not give me great circumstances, more money, more wealth, more fame, not blessing in that sense. Um, God, would you bring good into the core of my being? Bless you, bless you, bless you. No condemnation, bless you. I'm off. I'll talk to you later.